Hi, everyone. Welcome to another week of psychopharmacology. I'm super excited that we have a special guest. Um, this is Dr. Amy Stamatis, and she is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Rhode Island. And she's also um, a proud NKU alum. So thank you, Amy, for joining us and spending some time with us. Um, Maybe I'll just jump right in with the first question. Um, since you're from NKU originally, can you talk a little bit about your career path, um, how you started at your time as an undergraduate in NKU, and then where did you go from there? Uh, yeah, um, so thank you for asking me to um, come speak, Cecile. Um, I joined, I was trying to think of how far back this goes. So NKU, I, I started in uh, fall 2006 and I was a biology major to begin with. Um, I did not know what I wanted to do. So if you don't know what you wanna do, that's totally fine. I had, uh, I was taking a bunch of biology courses. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And then I remember taking evolutionary psychology with Dr. Hogan and I loved psychology. I liked learning about behavior. And so I think that semester, like I made the switch. And then I took this course in 2009 with you. And that's when I realized this is what I was really interested in. When I first joined in psychology, when I was taking careers uh, in psychology, I ended up doing a research internship with Cincinnati Children's. Um, hospital and because I thought I wanted to maybe work with kids and then I was collecting data over there and realized maybe that's not what I want to do and when I took this drugs class this was super interesting to me and I had to take I was in the honors program when I was at NKU and I had to do an honors thesis and that's when I reached out to you to mentor my honors thesis and so my senior year I worked in Dr. Marchinsky's lab and uh, did my honors thesis on binge shrinking and impulsivity in college students. And um, I graduated in 2010. And I that final year, I, I applied to graduate programs. I didn't get in. And Dr. Marchinsky uh, hired me in her lab. And so I helped coordinate um, projects in Dr. Marchinsky's lab for a couple of years. And, you know, that couple of years was the time where I really figured out what I wanted to do. I love doing substance use research. So everything that your students are learning about in this class right now was all very interesting to me. And I, I thought the alcohol chapters were most interesting. And, um, and then I knew I wanted to be in academia. So I applied for PhD programs in what, 2013, and then got into my graduate program in applied experimental psychology at Old Dominion University, which is in Virginia. And that program really focuses more on research methodology and statistics, but every lab in that program has a health focus, a health research focus. And the lab that I was in focused more on um, alcohol and other drug use. And, um, you know, I worked on a few interventions during grad school, so I helped coordinate. Um, they were all alcohol interventions. And I worked on a lot of other projects in graduate school. And I was in school from 2013 to 2019. And I don't know how much you talk about careers, but, you know, when I, when I was figuring out what's the next step? Normally there's a what we call a postdoctoral fellowship that you do. So after you get your graduate degree, you can apply for these fellowships or go on the job market. I decided to do both. And I managed to get um, a faculty position at University of Rhode Island. So um, I went straight from grad school into my faculty position where I've been for the last two years, almost two years now, a year and a half, I guess. Uh, the pandemic has been interesting. And um, yeah, so that's where I'm at now. It feels it feels a little bit like a whirlwind going back to however long ago. Um, but I feel full circle coming back here. Well, and um, it feels like you just left for me. <laughs> I don't know, but you got a PhD and now you're in a tenure track position. And 
So not that long ago, you were the one applying to graduate school. Now you're the one trying to, um, you know, look for the graduate student for your lab. You know, what do you look for when you're looking for new graduate students? What are sort of the things that help a student do well in an application process and maybe what not so great things? Yeah, the application process is interesting. I get asked about it a lot from students in my lab and um, even students applying to my lab. They, I've had students reach out and ask me what I'm looking for in my applications. And, um, you know, the whole application is really important. And it's important to know that I'm not, that the mentor that you're working, applying to work with isn't the only one reviewing it. Like at my program, all of the faculty review applications. So. All of it needs to be strong, but I would think, uh, you know, when I'm reviewing applications, I'm most interested in why you why are you choosing this program? So, what about this program is is going to help you reach your career goal? And um, and you know, what are your research interests? And what are you interested in studying? What do you want to do projects on? Because if it's not really aligned well with things that I study, I might not be the best mentor for you. And that's usually the way, you know, when students approach me and I ask them, you know, what are their research interests? As long as they're in like the substance use area, we can talk about that. But if you're interested in something like eating disorders, or I had this happen this last round of submissions, you know, somebody was interested in like sleep behavior. I'm like, I don't study sleep. so. I'm probably not the best mentor for you. So that's probably what I focus on the most is what, what are your research interests and what do you um, like about the program? Why are you applying to it? Part of that is just because I'm in, a, it, I'm in an experimental program, so it's not clinical. And I feel like sometimes, um, you know, I don't, I just wanna make sure students understand what the experimental program entails what that's going to require of you and that's really statistics and learning research methods so um those are really what i focus on the most i think your letters are important um you know i look at you know how your prior mentors or faculty like professors talk about you i think those are critical um you know if you have three letters that kind of say the same thing that and not that it's a red flag, but I think sometimes you want your letters to highlight different things about you. Like I remember when I applied to grad school, I had you write my letter about my, you know, my research. I had Dr. Barge write a letter about my performance in the classroom. And then I had my mentor at Cincinnati Children's talk about me, like more professional development kind of stuff. And so I felt like that was kind of a nice blend when I was applying. But, um, but yeah, like th those are all really important. I don't really focus on your transcripts. You know, I don't look at like what course it, like coursework you've taken. Um, I just want to make sure that you did well in your courses. And um, a lot of programs are doing this, but you at URI, we actually don't take GREs anymore. We don't even look at, at GRE scores. So um, that's not a part of our application process, but yeah, and all of my all of my applicants um, that I review, I always uh, chat with them after. You know, I call them before the actual interview day, so we talk about all all of these things more. Hopefully, it's informally. Like I'm trying to get to know you a little bit better and what your research interests are. But um, but yeah, that's usually what I look at. What you know, what are your goals? What why do you like the program? And what are your research interests? Um, to see if I'm a good match for you. Are there certain things when you're chatting informally with students that are good things versus not good things? Or do you usually give them the benefit of the doubt? <laughs> <laughs> I'm give, I give students the bet this year, you know, because of, because of the pandemic, everything was done virtually. And so like a lot of maybe like awkwardness that happened virtually I kind of just chalk it up to like this is just the virtualness and I'm sure I'm being awkward too that's really fine um I'm more I'm I'm more concerned that we're interacting the way that we're interacting is feels kind of natural because we're this is a partnership for me and you we're meant like I'm your mentor and 
I'm on this journey with you the next five years. So I just want to make sure that, um, you know, we have a good relationship um, going forward. Um, but, you know, if you're able to make like good convert, you know, like good small talk conversation too, I think that that's always kind of nice, but it's not critical. I don't think that, um, you know, when I'm talking to students on the phone or virtually, I just want to make sure that, you know, the way they're talking about research interests feels like they're really passionate about doing research and that's really what they want to do. That's really what I'm looking for. That, that's great. So um, what what projects are you working on right now? Or what are the things that you're sort of thinking about that you would work on in the next couple of years? Yeah, so, um, the pandemic put things on hold. I have, um, I ended up doing some data collection early, earlier on in the pandemic where we were looking at, so in my lab, we do experimental designs like what Dr. Marchinsky probably talks about in her class, but we also, um, I also do what's called ecological momentary assessment where we can send surveys to participants' bones in real time and we can ask them what their behaviors are throughout the day, you know, in their actual, you know, their actual real life. Um, so I did a three week daily diary earlier in the pandemic um, where I was asking them just like about daily stressors, social media use, um, sleep patterns, and then about like substance use. Like, are you craving to use substances today? Um, I measured like levels of fatigue you know, so we can kind of see like, are there certain stress and fatigue levels that are related to substance use patterns happening? Um, so that was sort of a project that I did earlier on. Um, right now we are gearing up to, we're allowed to go back and collect data in person. Again, we just got approved last week <laughs> to do it. So we'll be starting next month. Um, but that study is an experiment to really understand um, how environment affects um, affects certain substance use behaviors. And so what we're interested in understanding is, you know, if, if somebody wants to use substances, if they're craving substances, um, does that happen when you are in a bar environment? Is it the bar environment itself, so the alcohol stimuli in the bar environment, or is it the expectation that you're going to be drinking in that environment that's related to risk-taking behavior and craving for substances or alcohol is what we're measuring. So it's an experiment that we'll be doing. So participants are just coming into the lab. They're gonna uh, fill out some measures on risk-taking and impulsivity. We'll measure the baseline craving and then we'll put them into their conditions. So they're, they'll either be in like a neutral space or a bar space. And then they'll either be told that they're getting alcohol or not. So we can see sort of the interaction between expectation and the environment itself. So that's one project. And then what I'm hoping to do later on in the fall is a study that I got some funding for it last year and then everything got put on hold, but it's actually to see how, um, I don't know if you talk a lot about impulsivity in your class, but there's different measures on how, you know, we assess impulsive behavior. So what I wanted to know is how do these different assessments of impulsivity predict how people respond to drinking? So we're looking at probably some things that you talk about in the class or like these, um, these rewarding effects of alcohol, like how do people feel when they're drinking, like the stimulating effects or the sedative effects of drinking. Um, and then what's interesting about that is it's really a two-part study. So we're gonna do that in the bar lab. So I have a lab that looks like a bar. I don't think I mentioned that. It looks like a bar. You come in, it feels like you're in a dive bar. That was sort of the feel that I wanted to have. And um, so we're gonna measure that in that space. And then I'm actually following up with them 10 days later for 10 days um, in the real world using that ecological momentary assessment. So we're gonna measure their similar mood states or their subjective states while they're drinking in the real world to see if they sort of match up. And if they don't align, like what does that mean? Um, you know, is it a valid way to collect data? Um, 
but yeah, I know there's a lot there, but yeah, we're still doing a lot of projects, but something's got put on hold because of the pandemic. That's very cool that you have a bar lab. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> the students would love to see that. Um, okay, so last question. I know we don't have um, endless time, so I'll just finish up with the last one. So you took this psychopharmacology class at NKU online, and now it, several years have passed. You know, what kind of advice can you give to NKU students who are currently taking this class since you were in this same position? Yeah. I loved this class. When I took it, I took it with Dr. Marchinsky online. I like how you emphasized many years ago. It was many. And uh, and when I took it, I, I think I'm biased. I finished it, in, I think, two months early because everything was available online. I just, I loved this class so much. Um, and it's interesting because I was a teaching assistant for it in graduate school, and now I'm actually teaching this class this semester right now. So um, it's always this topic that gets, um, you know, it's it's come full circle. And I'm I'm I feel like I'm always involved with this textbook, you know, every semester in some in some capacity. Um, but if you're taking it online, um, you know, what always helped me when I was taking it with Dr. Marchinsky is really like figuring out my schedule for the week and making sure everything is like, you know, meeting my deadlines. I feel like sometimes online, like those can get lost a little bit. So I had a really structured schedule. And then I remember writing a paper for your class. I don't remember what I did the paper on. I just remembered, I felt so, um, I felt it was so interesting. I loved whatever I wrote that paper on. I wish I remembered it. I probably still have it, honestly, <laughs> on my computer. But I remember your feedback, uh, Dr. Marchinsky, I remember your feedback and you wrote, this was before I was in your lab. I, I got your paper, I got the paper back, I got your feedback. And it said that um, this is a great paper, you should go to grad school. That's what you wrote on it. And that's- Did I really? Yes, you told me I should go to grad school. And so <laughs> that's why I joined your lab and the rest is history. So who knows what would happened? Um, oh, that's so great. I didn't even remember that. I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah. So um, just enjoy the topic. I think it's, you know, it's obviously it's fascinating to me. I think it's a great class and, um, you know, stay on top of your deadlines and turn your stuff in. That's a great way to end because, you know, you yeah. bring tears to my eyes I <laughs> after a crazy year. That was the greatest thing to hear. So anyways, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I will share the link to some of your papers um, to the students. So thank I, you. Yeah, I still actually have my website. I don't know if you remember. My oh, website. yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. I'll share that. Is everything uh, I'll there? It. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll give it to you. Great. Thank you. Yeah.